danger in the jungle. There's a little valley between two hills. We were on one hill, and the enemy was on the other. Then we got orders to move the machine gun about 50 meters to the left of the big tree that was in the middle of the valley, and to find a safe place to put it before the enemy blew us all up. We found a place to put the gun and stayed there all night. We could hear shooting all round us, but they didn't hit us. When it was day again, our planes came and they blew up the enemy soldiers. Then we watched while our men moved off the hill and came down into the valley. Suddenly, somebody started shooting at them. We couldn't see the enemy soldiers because the jungle was too thick, but somebody was shooting at our men. The shooting was in front of us, which meant that the enemy soldiers were in between us and our men, and this meant that the enemy was able to come back and find us, so we had to get out fast. We began to move back to the hill, but Doyle suddenly saw more enemy soldiers who were going towards our men. We waited until they got to the top, then Bones began shooting with the machine gun. He probably killed 10 or 15 enemy soldiers. Doyle and I and the other two men threw grenades, but then an enemy soldier shot Bones in the head. I pulled the machine gun from his hands and shouted to Doyle. There was no answer. Two of them were dead, and Doyle was only just alive. I picked up Doyle and put him across my shoulders then I ran towards the hill. There were bullets flying all around me from behind. And then I saw more enemy soldiers in the low grass in front of me. They were shooting at our men on the hill. I ran fast, shouting and screaming as loudly as I could. And suddenly... I was in the middle of our soldiers, and everybody was pleased and hitting me on the back. My shouting and screaming frightened the enemy soldiers away. They just ran. The weeks went past slowly. I got a letter from my mom, and I wrote back to her that everything was okay. I also wrote a letter to Jenny Curran and asked Mom to ask her parents to send it on to her, but I didn't get a reply. Bubba and I decided that we would get a shrimp boat when we got home again and catch shrimps and make a lot of money. Bubba planned it all. It started to rain one day, and it didn't stop for two months. But we still had to look for enemy soldiers, and one day we found them. We were crossing a rice field when suddenly they started shooting at us. Somebody shouted, Back! I picked up my machine gun and ran towards some trees. I looked round for Bubba, but he wasn't there. Then I heard that he was out in the rice field, and he was hurt. So I left my gun by the trees and ran back into the field. Gump, you can't go out there, somebody shouted, but I just ran. 
Halfway out, I saw another man who was hurt. He was holding a hand up to me, so I picked him up and ran back to the trees with him. Then I ran out again and found Bubba. There was blood all over him, and he had two bullets in his stomach. He looked up at me and said, Forrest, why did this happen? What could I say? Then he said, Play me a song on the harmonica, will you? There was still a lot of shooting going on, but I played a song. Then all the color went out of Bubba's face, and he said something very softly. Home. And then he died. And that's all I've got to say about that. The rest of the night was terrible. The worst night that I've ever known. Nobody could get any help to us, and the enemy soldiers were so near that we could hear them talking. Then, when it got light, an American plane came and used fire throwers on the enemy, and almost on us. Suddenly, the trees were on fire, and men were running out of the jungle with burned skin and clothes. During all of this, somebody shot me in the back of the leg, but I can't remember when it happened. It didn't matter. Nothing mattered. Bubba was dead. The shrimp business idea was dead with him. I just wanted to die, too. Then our helicopters came, and the enemy soldiers who were left ran away. An hour later, I was out of there and on my way to the hospital in Da Nang. Chapter 6 The White House I was at the hospital for two months. After the first few weeks, my leg was getting better, and one day I went down into the little town, to the fish market. I bought some shrimps, and one of the cooks at the hospital cooked them for me. Two days later, I went back to the fish market and talked to a man who was selling shrimps. Where do you get them? I asked him. He immediately started talking fast in a language that I couldn't understand. But he took me somewhere, past all the boats and the beach. There, he took a net and put it in the water. When he took it out again, it was full of shrimps. Every day for the next few weeks, I went with Mr. Cheat, that was his name, and watched him while he worked. He showed me how to catch shrimps with the net, and it was so easy that an idiot was able to do it, which I did. One day, I got back to the hospital, and a Colonel Gooch said, Gump, we're going back to America together. You're going to see the President of the United States, and he's going to give you a medal because you were very brave. There were about 2,000 people waiting for us at San Francisco Airport when we got off the plane. What a surprise! A lot of them had beards and long hair. I thought perhaps they were there to welcome us, but I was wrong. They were shouting unpleasant things, and then somebody threw a tomato at Colonel Gooch, and it hit him in the face. He tried to clean it off, 
and not look angry, but I didn't want to wait for them to start throwing things at me. No, sir. I started running. The people ran after me, all two thousand of them, but they couldn't catch me. I ran all round the airport, and then I ran into a toilet and locked the door. I waited in there for almost an hour before I came out again. I went to look for Colonel Gooch, and I found him in the middle of a group of policemen. He was looking very worried until he saw me. Come on, Gump, he said. The plane for Washington is waiting for us. The Army sent a car to meet us at Washington Airport, and we drove to a really nice hotel. After we put our suitcases in our rooms, the Colonel asked me to go out to a bar with him for a drink. People are different here, he told me. They aren't like the people in California. He was wrong. When we got there, he bought me a beer, and he was telling me about the president and my medal when something happened. A pretty girl came up to our table, and the colonel thought she was a waitress. Get us two more drinks, please, he said. She looked at him and said, I won't get you anything, not as much as a glass of warm river water, you pig. And then she looked at me and said, And how many babies have you killed today, you big ape? Well, we went back to the hotel. Next morning, we got up early and went to the White House, where the President lives. It's a really pretty house with a big garden. A lot of Army people were there, and they immediately started shaking my hand and telling me that I was a brave man and that they were pleased to meet me. The president was a great big old man who talked like somebody from Texas, and there were a lot of people standing round him in the flower garden. Then an army man started to read something, and everybody listened. Everybody but me, because I was hungry and wanted some breakfast. At last, the army man finished reading, and then the president came up and gave me the medal. After that, he began to shake my hand. I was just thinking of getting out of there and having some breakfast when the president said, Boy, is that your stomach making that noise? So I said, Yes. And the president said, Well, come on, boy. Let's go and get something to eat. And I followed him into the house, and a waiter got us some breakfast. The president asked me a lot of questions about Vietnam and the army, but I just said, Yes, it's okay, or shook my head to say no. And after several minutes of this, we were both silent. Do you want to watch TV? The president asked suddenly. So, me and the president of America watched TV while I ate my breakfast. Later, when we were back in the garden, the president said, You were hurt, weren't you, boy? Well, look at this. And he pulled up his shirt and showed me the place on his stomach where he was hurt once. Where were you hurt? He asked me. 
So I pulled down my trousers, turned round, and showed him. Well, lots of newspaper men started taking photographs before Colonel Gooch could run across and pull me away. That afternoon, back at the hotel, he came to my room shouting and throwing newspapers onto the bed. And there I was, on the front page, with my trousers down. Gump, you idiot! shouted Colonel Gooch. Yes, sir, I said. That's what I am. But I just try to do the right thing. Chapter 7 Soon after that, I heard that I was leaving the army early, and they gave me some money for a train ticket to go home. But all this time, I was thinking about Jenny Curran. Just before I left the hospital in Da Nang, I had a letter from her. She was now playing in a group called the Broken Eggs, and they played two nights each week at a place called the Ho Daddy Club near Harvard University. Now that I was free from the army, I just wanted to go and see her. So I got a ticket for Boston instead of Mobile. I tried to walk to the Ho Daddy Club from the train station, but I lost my way, so I took a taxi. It was in the afternoon, and the man behind the bar said, Jenny'll be here about nine o'clock. Can I wait? I asked. Okay, he said. So I sat down and waited for five or six hours. Students began to come in, most of them wearing dirty jeans. The men had beards, and the women had long, untidy hair. Later, the group, the Broken Eggs, arrived, but I didn't see Jenny. Then they began to play, and they were loud. The music sounded like a plane that was taking off, but the students loved it. And then Jenny came on. She was different. Her hair was all the way down her back, and she was wearing sunglasses at night. She was wearing blue jeans, and a shirt with lots of colors on it. The group started playing again, and Jenny began to sing. Later, I went outside and walked around for about half an hour, then went back. There were a lot of people waiting to go in, so I went round to the back of the place and sat on the ground. I had my harmonica in my pocket, so I took it out and started to play. I could hear the music that was playing inside, and after a minute or two, I began playing with it. Suddenly, a door behind me opened, and there was Jenny. Who is that playing the harmonica? she said. And then she saw me. Forrest Gump! And she ran out of the door and threw her arms round me. We talked together until it was time for her to sing again. I didn't leave school, said Jenny. They threw me out after they found a boy in my room one night. I went to California and stayed there for some time. She laughed. I wore flowers in my hair and talked about love. 
but the people that I was with were strange. Then I met a man, and we came to Boston, but he was dangerous. He was against the war, like me, but he blew up buildings and things. I couldn't stay with him. Next, I met a teacher from Harvard University, but he was married. Then I began to sing with the broken eggs. Where do you live? I asked. With my boyfriend, she said. He's a student. You can come back and stay with us tonight. The boy's name was Rudolph. He was a little man, and he was sitting on the floor with his eyes shut when we got to Jenny's flat. Rudolph, this is Forrest, Jenny said. He's a friend of mine from home, and he's going to stay with us for a few days. Rudolph didn't speak or open his eyes, but he put up his hand and smiled. Next morning, when I got up, Rudolph was still sitting on the floor with his eyes shut. That afternoon, Jenny took me to meet the other people in the group, and that night, I began playing my harmonica with them at the Ho Daddy Club. It went well, and I played with them every night after that. Then one day, I came back to the flat, and Jenny was sitting on the floor. Where's Rudolph, I asked. Gone, she said. Walked out, like all the others. And then she started to cry. Don't cry, Jenny, I said. And I put my arm round her. Well, it started like that. But the next minute, we were kissing and making love. And when we finished, Jenny said, Forrest, where have you been all this time? Into Space Spring went by, and I continued to play my harmonica with the group. It was my happiest time of all. But, you've guessed it, something went wrong. How did it happen? I don't know, but one night I was sitting outside the Ho Daddy Club smoking a cigarette when a girl smiled and came up to me. She sat down across my legs and put her arms round me. She was laughing and kissing me, and I didn't know what to do. Suddenly, the door opened behind me and there was Jenny. For it's time to... She stopped when she saw me with the girl. And then she said, Oh no, not you too. I jumped up and pushed the girl away. Jenny, I said. Stay away from me, Forrest, she said. You men are all the same. Just stay away from me. She me again that night, and the next morning, she told me to find another place to live. I went to live with Moses, one of the other men in the group, and soon after that, Benny went to Washington to talk and work against the war. Moses wrote down the address for me. So, I went back to Washington, too. There was a lot of trouble there. Police were everywhere, and people were shouting and throwing things, and the police were taking some of them away. I went to find Jenny's address, but there was nobody at home. I waited outside for most of the day. Then... At about nine o'clock, 
a car stopped near the house, and some people got out. And there she was. I started to walk towards her, but she turned and walked away. The other people, two men and a girl, didn't know what to say. What's wrong with her? I asked one of the two men. She just got out of prison, he said. She was there all night before we could get her out. Penny was in the back of the car now. So I went over and talked to her through the window. I told her how I felt. I was sorry about the girl, and I didn't want to play in the group without her. She listened quietly, then opened the car door for me to get in, and we sat and talked. Others were talking about something that would happen the next day. Some American soldiers planned to take off their Vietnam medals and throw them away in front of the crowds of people. Suddenly, Jenny said, Did you know that Forrest won a medal? The others went quiet and looked at me, then looked at Jenny. Next morning, Jenny came into the living room. I was sleeping on the floor of their house. She woke me up. Forrest, she said, I want you to do something for me. What, I said. I want you to come with us today, and I want you to wear your army clothes. Why, I asked. Because you do something to stop all the killing in Vietnam. It's what I had to do, can't you? I had to throw away my medal with the other American soldiers. But because my medal was a more famous medal than theirs, it was more important to Jenny and her friends. But it got me into more trouble. Oh, I threw my medal away okay, but it hit somebody really important of the president's men so they threw me into prison why do things like that always happen to me Suddenly, somebody started shooting at them. We couldn't see the enemy soldiers because the jungle was too thick, but somebody was shooting at our men. The shooting was in front of us, which meant that the enemy soldiers were in between us and our men, and this meant that the enemy was able to come back and find us, so we had to get out fast. We began to move back to the hill, but Doyle suddenly saw more enemy soldiers who were going towards our men. We waited until they got to the top, then Bones began shooting with the machine gun. He probably killed 10 or 15 enemy soldiers. Doyle and I and the other two men threw grenades. 
But then an enemy soldier shot Bones in the head. I pulled the machine gun from his hands and shouted to Doyle. There was no answer. Two of them were dead, and Doyle was only just alive. I picked up Doyle and put him across my shoulders. Then I ran towards the hill. There were bullets flying all round me from behind. And then I saw more enemy soldiers in the low grass in front of me. They were shooting at our men on the hill. I ran fast, shouting and screaming as loudly as I could. 